First of all, what's the name of this talk? Anyone? You have to shout. <laughs> How about that? An, in, an, an example of something called a Caesar cipher, a sub, simple substitution cipher. In our tech industry, we t sometimes call it rot rotation cipher. My name is Jeff Mann. I am a former NSA cryptologist, uh, consultant advisor, uh, industry old timer, and uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime for questions, mentoring, uh, set, take pictures, send them to me. Um, spent the early part of my career, as I said, at NSA. I've been out for almost 30 years now. Uh, 20 years ago, I got into doing something called PCI. Has PCI ever been said from stage at DEF CON before? I don't know. <laughs> Um, most people in this industry know me because I was uh, one of the architects, one of the founders of what came to be known as the first NSA red team. So I was doing pen testing back in the early 90s and uh, did it up until about the mid 90s for NSA. But I was also a crypt analyst at NSA, which is why I'm here talking, representing the crypto and privacy village, by the way. Um, I was working as a crypto cryptologist designing systems back in the late 80s. One of the things I did because uh, computers were becoming a thing, the digital age was becoming a thing. Uh, I had a cl client that asked if they could do a, a paper manual process on a PC and was able to produce what I think was the first software-based NS NSA produced, which only did half of it. The spy in the field was still using the paper but the case handler was using a, a pc and got the the one-time pad key uh put on floppy disk i also had another customer u.s special forces that i designed a cipher wheel for that, that would help them with their encryption and decryption in the field of one-time pads but this is just a little bit of crypto cryptographic history uh, to explain where we came from in cryptography, you were just hearing a talk talking about encryption that works in the digital age. Um, but basically, people have been trying to keep secrets for thousands of years. And in the early days, it was primarily keeping secrets and communicating messages from one end to another, uh, very often used by the military, trying to get commands and directions to troops on the battlefield from the command headquarters and the generals and things like that. Um, there's basically, historically, two different ways of doing that, two different ways of protecting messages, and that's called codes and ciphers. The difference between the two, very briefly, the way I learned it many years ago, is code is something you do to words and phrases or thoughts and ideas to try to shrink it down to something that's briefer to transmit and to communicate. Whereas a cipher is something you're doing to scramble and create what they what used to be called a cryptogram, but it's a one character, one letter, one number uh, relationship. Uh, there's two ways of doing that. One way is to do like the title uh, of this talk, a substitution. You're replacing the real letters, the real characters for something obscure and different in hopes of confusing people, which seem to work since a lot of not a people, not a lot of people seem to know what the name of the talk was. Uh, the other thing you can do is you simply uh, scramble the, the letters, uh, um, same letters, just put them in a different order in some way where the intended recipient know, knows how to put it back together. I can give you a real brief example. This is an example of a, a, a transposition. Anybody know what my shirt says? No more secrets. Close. Too many secrets. Too many secrets. Very good. Um, in terms of US history, uh, you know, back in the American Revolution, uh, there was codes and ciphers used. And uh, an example of a code would be 
uh, one if by land, two if by sea. Big long phrases reduced down to just a light or two lights in a church bell tower. Um, there was also codes being used by the uh, the armies. They had entire code books written up where numbers would represent all sorts of words. And uh, just as an example, there was Agent 711, which was actually the code for George Washington, General of the Army. They also were using ciphers, but in this particular instance, they weren't using letters to replace letters. They were using symbols, but it was still a Caesar cipher. It was a still a simple substitution system. And of course, Caesar cipher, that was actually used by the Confederate Army in, in the Civil War. They had, they had a cipher wheel themselves, which was part of the inspiration for the cipher wheel that I designed many years later. Um, Freemasons, they have loved to use ciphers for many years. The particular cipher they use, these are examples of tomb tone, tombstones of dead members of the Freemasons, and they often would leave messages, encrypted messages on, on their team, so tombstones using something called a pig pen cipher, where instead of letters, they would write letters into like tic-tac-toe squares, and instead of the letters, they would simply use the shape of the box or the cell that the letter fell in. This is kind of what it looks like. If you've ever seen the movie National Treasure, they have a, something that they call the Ottendorf cipher, where there's a whole bunch of numbers written on the back of the Declaration of Independence in invisible ink. And that translates to, if you know the right book, the particular page of a book, the particular line on the page, and, and the particular letter across the line. Um, that really kind of existed. That is something that was done in the revolution. It was called the Arnold Cipher. Um, Other examples of transpositions, and this goes back, uh, I think it's to the ancient Egyptians. They used to have a stick of a certain size and wrap a leather strap around it write their message and then unwind unwind it and so it was just a bunch of random letters written out on this big long strip they would send it to the recipient he would have to have the same size stick to wrap it rack back together again and put it back in order also something that was used that i learned about in my early days was something that's sort of like a, a crossword puzzle but you have a, a sort of a stencil a square with certain holes cut out of it you'd write your message in one letter at a time rotate it, keep going with your message, rotate it, and so on and so forth. When you pull it up, you've got a, a square filled with letters in a random order that hopefully nobody could figure out how to put it back together. Um, another example of something that I learned uh, back in my days is something called a substitution cipher Playfair, where you would um, put the letters of the alphabet in a five by five square um, of course, we had 26 letters in the alphabet, so we had to double up very commonly. It was J, K, but it could have been anything else. Um, the first ones were just simply A to Z, but to add a, a level of complexity, very often you would start using a keyword. Did I do that? Hey! Who is this guy? Um, to add complexity, you'd start with a keyword and write the letters of that word out in the square, and then you've used a letter once, you'd fill in the rest of the square with the alphabet. And then the, the way that you would do the encryption and the decryption was basically create a square with the letter that you wanted to write, and then make a, a square um, and find out what the cipher is, if that makes sense to you by looking at it. Um, World War II, Navajo, um, uh, natives were enlisted to be radio operators and code talkers. Uh, the Japanese, the enemy, never broke the code. They were not only just speaking in their native tongue, which apparently the Japanese could, had a hard time understanding, but they were using words to mean other things. So you can see some examples there, you know, like a battleship was a whale, things like that. Seems intuitive now that that would have made sense, but it worked. Um, 
machine encryption started coming uh, popular in the in the 30s and you know most famously in World War II, there was the German Enigma machine. Um, I went to work for the NSA in 1986. Was learning about things like this and sort of basic courses that we took to get introduced to the field, um, mostly to try to bide our time while our clearances, our background investigations were being completed. I learned at that time in 1986 that uh, we weren't telling people that the Enigma machine had been broken back in World War II. That was still a secret. It wasn't revealed to the public that the Enigma machine had been broken in World War II, uh, prior to World War II, until I think 1987 or 88. The reason being, there was still somebody out there that was using it. Um, it was first broken in 1938 by Polish cryptographers and used for 50 years after that. And we kept a secret that we knew how to break it. I don't think there's anything else that we've ever done in terms of secrecy that, that's held up that long. We being the US, we being NSA types. Um, some of the radios and equipment that were uh, being used when I was there at NSA back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of these were Vietnam era. But uh, again, it was about communication security. When I first went to work for the defensive side of operations, it was called COMSEC, communication security. Shortly after that, it was named, renamed information security. So we called it InfoSec. Um, but some of these radios initially, they would take an analog signal and they would apply a, an encryption algorithm, usually built into a little black box, because that's what NSA built in those days with key being applied to it. So there was encryption involved and then a receiver on the other end that could reverse the process. Um, later on, there was uh, radios and devices that would convert the analog signal to digital and then do the encryption of the digits, send it, and then do the whole process in reverse. Um, these are just different examples. Um, one other way to try to <laughs> defeat the enemy from or adversary from intercepting the signal was not only encrypting it, but trying to hide it across frequencies. So send a little bit here, then using some sort of random algorithm that was predictable on both sides, send more and more of the signal just on different frequencies. Interestingly enough, that concept was uh, invented by Hedy Lamarr, a, a movie actress from the 1920s. That's just a shout out to women. We need more women in industry because they're smarter than us men very often. As the systems advanced, uh, keys needed to be more complex and, and longer, and keys needed to be changed frequently. And when you were putting it into a little black box, you needed to have key, key machines that could put that inject the keys. So see, these are some examples of key injectors. Um, this was something that was trying to be popular uh, again when I was at NSA in the late 80s, uh, sort of trying to get modern. So they had a little thing called a KL-43 that had a keyboard and had a little LCD screen that I think held, you could see 32 digits. And the idea was you type in a message and it would immediately be encrypted on the screen. Usually it would be output to, um, gosh, we didn't have thumb drives back then. Uh, it would either be transmitted automatically or be printed out on paper for distribution. But the idea was this was high tech self-contained encryption system rather than a little black box or a little black inside of a, a radio or a phone or a little black box that the radio or phone was attached to. Um, Stu 3 telephone was what we were using at the time. So it was one of the first times that NSA put out for bid to a contractor uh, an idea of, you know, NSA came up with the specs, but, um, different contractors bid on the idea of how to make a secure phone. Um, these secure phones were starting to use public key cryptography and the keys were seeded with these things that looked like keys, but you had to stick it in, turn it, have it read it and set it up. And uh, the first ones were half duplex, which means kind of like a walkie talkie. It's push to talk, 
one-way communication, then you let go, and then the other person would talk back. On a telephone, uh, that was often very difficult. And because of the encryption, uh, when you used it, you kind of sounded, the people on the other end kind of sounded like Donald Duck. But it was modern technology at the time. And eventually they were able to put it into smartphones, cell phones, so it became more portable. Um, very briefly, you know, now we're in the age of digital cryptography, things have evolved. Um, we all use cryptography every day in, in our lives on the internet. And there's probably a lot of you guys know, know this, but there's basically two forms of encryption. There's symmetric encryption, where it's the same key used on either end of the communication. And the communication these days are websites and so on and so forth. Um, and then the other uh, type, public key cryptography, is the idea of key pairs, where it's a one-way, there's a public and a private key. I hold my private key and give you my public key, and I give all of you my public key, because you can encrypt a message that I can only decrypt with my private key. But for me to talk back to you, I've got to get your public key, and I can write a message and send it to you, and you're the only one that can decrypt it. Um, very simplified view. Uh, there is a third form up in Canada, and it's called symmetric A encryption. That was a joke. Um, Whitfield Diffie, he, he was uh, affiliated with NSA off and on, Diffie-Hellman algorithm. I actually took a course with him early on at NSA. That's why I kind of threw his name, picture up there. And then you got the modern age and all the fun stuff coming, like with quantum. I don't want to say that much about quantum cryptography. Um, the other big thing that's popular, I just saw it earlier in the week, I was down at that other conference that we don't mention around here, but the idea of homomorphic encryption, which really rubs me the wrong way because I spent my entire career and learned about all the different ways that we protect data, protect data, encrypt data, with the idea that we're keeping things a secret. But people are coming up with ways of being able to encrypt data but still get meaningful information out of it. I don't get my head wrapped around that very well. I kind of think that, okay, it's neat technology. It's a neat idea. Just don't call it encryption. But I'm losing that battle, as many other battles. Um, just in terms of why I kind of put this talk together, um, I know several months ago, I do a podcast called Paul Security Weekly. And gosh, it was probably a year ago. We were talking to somebody and, and somebody uh, in the chat when we used to broadcast live was saying something about encryption and encoding. And I'm like, you know, those are two different things. And he's like, well, no, they're interchangeable. So I like went out to Google, uh, the meaning of the words. And I went, I found on Wikipedia, the, um, definition here and I'm reading through it and I'm gonna have to stick to my laptop here for a minute. It says, well, you can read it, but it uses encryption saying it's the process of encoding. And um, later on, it talks about uh, ciphertext, plain text. But this has always been kind of a beef with me because there's codes and there's ciphers. And encoding is something you do with code. And enciphering is something you do with ciphers. They're two different things, but they're very often used interchangeably. Uh, which bothers me because I'm, I'm a purist. Another thing I found was another definition, and they talked to, oops, sorry. They talked about uh, secret codes, and there's talking about coding and decoding, and that's how you get ciphers. That's not technically accurate. Um, if you remember, I shared this earlier. Um, this is sort of the summary of what codes and ciphers are. And I, I kind of wanted to set out and try to give some information about why I, I say these words are wrong. And uh, the CFP that I submitted, they gave me feedback that this was sounding subjective and opinion-based, but it's actually not. Um, I have sort of the Bibles of cryptography. They were just declassified at some point. I was allowed to keep my copies of uh, military cryptanalytics, Cryptanalytics Volumes 1 and 2, or Part 1 and 2, um, written by gentlemen that were very highly respected cryptographers before World War II, sort of became the pioneers in the formation of NSA, uh, Lambros Kalimahos. And uh, if you guys have gone to the village and you've heard about the Goldbug Award, there's also a society at NSA of cryptographers 
uh, called the Dundee Society. You can see the explanation of it there. But then also the other author was William and Friedman. Thank you. Between he and uh, his wife, Elizabeth Friedman, uh, they were sort of responsible. They're, they're sort of considered the godfather, the god, godmother of cryptography. So these are the authors. These guys were the ones breaking the codes and ciphers back in World War II. Um, so very quickly, the definitions that they wrote that are written down uh, are such, and hopefully you can see it on the screen there. I just want to highlight a couple things here where... Again, it's in writing, ciphers have to do with individual letters, I say characters, and then the codes have to do with words and phrases. Oh, this is something I picked up. I was reading, you know, preparing for this this morning, and I thought this was kind of interesting. I hadn't noticed it before, but there's a statement there that simply says, you do these things, you encrypt things and create cryptograms for one of two reasons secrecy and economy or brevity. And I thought that was interesting because the way I was learning code and cipher, especially when we we're starting to get into computers and, and internet technology, encoding was always considered a way to shrink down, compress the data so it could be sent quicker and more easily. And we never presumed that it was secure. That's what the encryption was for. So brevity or speed, coding, secrecy, protection of what you're trying to transmit, cipher. Um, and then finally, just a, a brief mention here again, where they talk about the introduction of key. And we know key now most commonly is certificates, but key was really any method that was used and agreed upon by both sides um, as how you were gonna do the, the, the encryption, the protection. Nowadays, it's mostly just throwing huge random streams that hopefully nobody can figure out and giving the random streams to both ends to go through a very complex mathematical algorithm. That's where we are today. But just to summarize in terms of why I think words have meanings and why I think we need to understand the meanings of the words, even in our modern digital context, is going back to the fundamentals of where they came from codes and ciphers, and I would suggest to you that, again, think about codes or encoding as just a way to compress and increase speed, not necessarily security. That's where the cipher and the encryption and the big, long key streams come in. Um, real briefly, it's all about protection of data, information, keeping secrets. You probably know about the idea of confidential integrity and availability and then digital age and introduce things like non-repudiation. We spent most of our time in the digital age focusing on the confidentiality. Nowadays, we're trying to figure out how to do the availability because of all the ransomware attacks that are out there. Um, one last thing, that cipher wheel I mentioned, um, it was put on display at the National Cryptologic Museum uh, in Fort Meade, Maryland back in April. And uh, it's on display through, December, through September, if you make it to Maryland, uh, it's in a display case. There I am looking at it, and there, there's the display. If, I mean, you could probably not read it there, but it says, Jeff Mann reinvents the wheel. So thank you very much.